To have iconic species as your flagship to a particular conservation helps a lot. It's a quite uh, unique attraction and uh, it's quite incidental success where people come in to see this, you know, this tiny penguin, 30 centimeters tall, walking across the beach, look like a toddler, and uh, so people love it. And of course, uh, you know, kids, they just absolutely adore. The natural ecosystems we depend upon are in crisis globally, with around a million species at risk of disappearing from the wild. Penguins feed in the ocean and breed on land, so they face dangers in both places, with over half of penguin species threatened with extinction. I'm on the southeastern coast of Australia to meet the conservationists who are making big strides in protecting the world's littlest penguin. You know, it doesn't look like, but we're in the middle of the largest little penguin colony in the world. Every little hole you see, it's actually a, a penguin nest. Amazing. Oh, I can see some of them. They're, these are the, some of the man-made ones. So how many penguins are there actually in this area? So we probably have about 4,000 penguins in this particular area. Just in this part, wow. But, but on Phillip Island, we have about 32,000 penguins. Oh, can you hear? Can you hear them? They make like a little <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah, so it's all hidden. They're all hidden around yeah, here. Yeah, uh, every, you know, every little hole you see it. Yeah. It's a, it's a penguin nest. There are 18 species of penguins around the world, and they're all in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So little penguins is uh, endemic to Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the only places that the population are doing well are places that there's some conservation plans in place. Our job here is look after Philip Island. And if we look after penguins, so we bring together all the other species that benefit from those conservation plans. So when you protect the penguins, you're protecting lots of other animals as well. Exactly. Andre and his team work off the southern coast of Australia on Phillip Island where the Summerland Peninsula has become a refuge for the iconic little penguin. Over the past few decades, the team has slowly transformed the penguin's habitat, so they're well protected when they come ashore, especially during the breeding season, which is happening now. It's crucial for the future of the colony that the chicks grow into healthy adults. So research officer Jordan Roberts is monitoring their development closely armed with a microchip scanner and other tools to record their progress. They're basically all around us right now. Yeah, so you can see some of the mortgage-free penguin homes that we built. Mortgage-free. Mortgage-free <laughs> little <laughs> nest boxes, but others have to um, dig them themselves, so we call those natural burrows. Okay. So do we know who's at home in this one? The, we have two little fluffy chicks in this one just here, but oh. we have to find out exactly how much they weigh. Mm -hmm. I've got our two bags because there's two chicks in here. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna open this up. Okay, so. Selected chicks are weighed three times a week to check how they're developing. And the larger one of a pair is marked with food coloring to tell them apart. Oh, come here, come on. Stop trying to, come on. Oh wow, look at that. All right, so just where you can see, oh, good little penguin. Don't bite me, little penguin. So a nice kind of big patch. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you get my fingers. Okay. Do you want to put this um, penguin back as well? Yes, so just please. pop that back in the bag. Okay, so just kind of hold. Oh, Ooh, that's okay. So hold where my hands are. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Ooh. And I'll help you put him back. Thank you. Yeah, got it. Got him? Got him, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, don't bite me, little one. There, there you go. go. Beautiful. Aww, good work. Good and we've job. now both got green yeah. fingers. <laughs> Eudiptila minor, commonly known as the little penguin, is the smallest of the world's 18 penguin species, at only around 30 centimetres tall, compared to the emperor penguin, which stands at over 110 centimetres. The chicks start life brown and fluffy. As they get older, they gradually shed their downy feathers to develop their unique blue and white adult plumage. 
Each animal has around 10,000 tiny blue and white feathers at around three to four times the density per square centimetre of other birds to help insulate them from the cold southern waters. So you can see the beautiful brand new feathers and it's still got some of those oh, little fluffy fly. chick ones. You can see just how blue it is here. Yeah. This chick will return next year to find its own home. But the penguins aren't the only ones who want to live in this prime coastal location. Why have you made the artificial nest boxes? So uh, there's been areas within the Summerlin Peninsula that unfortunately in the past have been disturbed by human activity. So there actually used to be a fairly large housing estate in between us here and the Nobbies, which is about three kilometres mm. west of where we are. Little penguins can nest up to two kilometres inland and 190 homes and other buildings once covered their breeding grounds, which led to their burrows being destroyed and penguins being run over by cars or killed by cats and dogs. There was a big housing buyback scheme where the government, it took nearly 30 years, but bought all the houses back and now uh, it's been completely rehabilitated into penguin habitat. But the thing is, with lots of roads and houses, it compacted the soil a lot. So that's why we've built these little artificial nest boxes, just to help them out a little bit. It's amazing what they've done here. I've reported before on whole villages being knocked down to make way for open cast coal mines. But this is thought to be one of the only places in the world where a thriving suburb has been demolished for wildlife. Along with other measures, it's helped prevent disaster for the penguins. Back in the mid 1980s, the colony got down to about 8,000 penguins and it seemed to be dropping kind of quite consistently. And if the trajectory kind of kept continuing, there was going to be no penguins left by the year 2000. But um, in the 1980s, that's when they started fox eradication works and started the Summerlin buyback. In the past, the European red fox, which was deliberately introduced to Australia by settlers for hunting, was one of the other biggest threats to penguins here. But after decades of work, foxes were finally eliminated from Phillip Island around five years ago, benefiting not only the penguin colony. So Jordan, since the foxes were eradicated from the island and you know, all the other conservation work that's been done, have you seen lots of other wildlife kind of flourish? Yeah, absolutely. So foxes were really devastating to our native species here on Phillip Island. But things like Cape Barren geese, we've got um, swamp that's wallabies. Over here. Yeah, yeah, that's them. Got a little, a little family just over here. The second rarest species of goose in the world. We've got the ringtail and brushtail possums. Our native purple swamp hens as well. They've really, really bounced back um, in the absence of foxes. And one of the most exciting things that we've been able to do um, is introduce the eastern bar bandicoot to Phillip Island. Island. Ah, what's and that? It's a little small marsupial, so it's got a little pouch like a kangaroo or a koala. Um, it's kind of the sort, size of a small rabbit and uh, they're classified as extinct on mainland Australia, but we're lucky enough to have a very healthy colony out here. The experience here shows that when you take extraordinary measures to protect the habitat of an iconic species, the whole ecosystem can flourish. Foxes may be gone from Phillip Island, but along the mainland and on smaller islands closer to shore, they continue to be a prime threat to the penguins' survival, and many colonies have been wiped out. We've come a couple of hundred kilometres west to the city of Warrnambool, where the local penguin population has come back from the brink, thanks to some unlikely allies. So they might bark at you initially, okay. um, but that's good because they're doing their job. But once they see that I'm there and bringing you in, they'll be complaining. Okay, great. Hello. So, this is Isola. Oh. She's very friendly. She loves people. And you kind of want to do a bit once you get to know them. This is Oberon. He's the youngest. So, he's one and a half. And then we've got Metzor here. He's got a cute little smile. And then Isola. So, they're Italian dogs. And so, what have these sheepdog got to do with penguins? We started having this horrible problem out at Middle Island between about the year 2000 and 2005 where foxes started coming to the island. And unfortunately, they don't just kill for survival. They will kill for fun, so right. thrill kill. So they can kill over 100, whether it's chickens, whether it's 
shearwaters, another um, flying bird, whatever it is, they can kill over 100 individuals in a night. 100 in a night. So at the time, there was a third year student out at our local university, Deakin University, and he actually worked on a chicken farm and they used maremas to protect the chickens. And so he was chatting to Swampy, the chicken farmer at the time, and, you know, Swampy said, well, penguins are just chickens in fancy dinner suits, so <laughs> why not put a couple of maremas out on the island? <laughs> and after a lot of big, long process and a lot of things that hoops to jump through, a marema did get approved to go on Middle Island. Um, away from the other dogs. Maremas are Italian sheepdogs, which have been bred for thousands of years to protect livestock from predators. This is the first time they've ever been trained to protect wildlife. They're being really friendly with us now, and that's because you're here. Yeah, so maremas are a very different breed of dog to our normal domestic stay-at-home dogs. They're more closely related to wolves, and they have a really strong instinct to guard. So if we came up to here, or for example, when they're out protecting the penguins and we weren't with you, yep. they would bark at us. They and... would definitely bark at you. They wouldn't be happy with you being there. But yeah, definitely, their, their whole job is to protect, so. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh. Someone's here who they don't know. Yeah, so sometimes there's foxes in the paddock. Oh yeah, I see it. Good dogs. So this is exactly what you want them to be doing on the island. Yeah, absolutely. This is exactly what they should do. These dogs are trained to protect Middle Island, a small rocky outcrop on the coast, not far from here, that's home to a colony of little penguins. Whoa! <laughs> oh, <you're right. laughs> so we pop the front, front paws in and then get him back in. And he's a very big dog in a little car. Trish, I don't think I quite appreciated how big they were until Medso was like almost on top of me. He is massive. <laughs> he is a very big dog. Wow. <laughs> I think if I was a small animal, I would be really glad to have him as my protector. Absolutely. Yeah, you wouldn't want to get in between him and whatever he's protecting against. And so the island, is it right next to the city or where are we headed? Yeah, so it's near the, there's a breakwater. So it's right near the breakwater and it's only about 100 metres offshore. So we'll just wade out to it. So we don't even take a boat or anything like that to get to the island. We just walk out through the water. A man-made breakwater built to protect the local marina changed the distribution of sand near the island and a formerly deep channel became shallow enough to cross. Foxes began to get over at low tide and kill penguins en masse. That is until the dogs arrived. Okay, so we'll just get Metzo out. Dying Very excited. That car, isn't he? Hey, Hello. This way, buddy. Come around this way. There we go. Down your pop, good man. Okay. Trish is so beautiful here. It is, it's stunning. We're so lucky to live here. So this is the beautiful Middle Island in the background. So these two are ready oh, to go over. Right. <laughs> Come over here, buddy. The dogs patrol the island full time during the little penguin breeding season from August to February. And Trish and her team visit daily to feed the dogs and swap them over. Last night there was a big storm and the dogs had to be removed. So with Trish's colleague, Ali, we're hoping to get them back on at low tide tonight. And so Trish, did there used to be um, little penguin colonies all along here, including on the mainland? Yeah, so there actually used to be a lot more little penguin colonies than there are now. And because of threats like foxes and also wild dogs and cats, they pretty much, unless they're on an island, they've been completely wiped out. In 2006, with public support, the island was close to humans and the first maremma was put on guard. But when the sea's rough like today, getting them over can be a challenge. So the channel's actually really deep today and Trisha's just gone to check whether we can cross and it's not looking good. Um, you can just see those massive waves bringing the swell in. Any joy? Unfortunately, it's a no-go. Oh. 
that it, it looks quite shallow from over here, but when we're actually over there, the channel's really deep and the current coming through is really quite strong. So unfortunately, it's just not safe to cross over tonight. We're working with nature here, right? <laughs> That's so. right. Nature is so unpredictable and this crossing is so unpredictable, but you just never know. Yeah, bad yeah. timing. Yeah, unfortunately. This makes me even more amazed that the foxes have been getting over. Yeah, it's really surprising because um, Generally, they will go across when it's shallow, when it's really, um, you know, that sort of ankle deep crossing. But we have had them swim before. The foxes may be relentless in their efforts, but they're no match for the maremmas. And no penguins have been killed while the dogs are on duty. The maremmas are so much bigger than a fox, but I mean, we've seen out at the farm how they react to a fox. So yeah. definitely we, uh, you wouldn't want to come up against a maremma if you were a fox. It's absolutely incredible to see how the project works. You'll actually see fox prints sometimes. You see them coming right up to the edge of the water and then they turn around. So Amazing. when the dogs are there, they know they're there. When the project started, there were only four penguins left on Middle Island. Now there are between 70 and 100. When we can't get to Middle Island, what we do is we go and scent the beach. So we take the dogs around, we get them to wee. They're molting a lot at the moment, so that's great. We can use their fur and we actually put that in amongst the rocks and that sort of thing to keep their scent here. So the foxes know we can't go anywhere near there. The maremmas don't kill the foxes. The dog's scent is enough to deter them and any braver foxes are scared away by the dog's bark. So somewhere just like in here where Yeah, it's yep, so just work. push it back a little bit. Yep, there you go. Yeah, that's uh -huh. yours. A few days after we left, the crossing was back to being ankle deep and Trish got the dogs back on the island. The Maremma's instinct to protect is so strong that they're constantly on patrol. They can stay on the island for up to two weeks at a time and don't even sleep in their kennels because they want to be able to hear and see threats at all times. The success of these pioneering canine conservationists has led to the technique being replicated to protect a colony of gannets and even endangered marsupials. But for the last couple of years, the penguins have been arriving late on Middle Island to breed and the team suspect there may be a problem with their food supply at sea. So we've come back to Phillip Island. We've learned a lot about what's been done to protect the little penguins on land. And now we're gonna find out more about their marine-based conservation. Oh, that's Hello. good time, Sylvia. Hello. Hi, Sylvia. I'm Megan, so, nice, Megan. To meet you. nice to meet you. <laughs> so we, we just, uh, Megan and I, we're just doing some, uh, setting up some loggers to put on the penguins. So you, you got oh. in a good time. Rebuilding the penguins' habitat on land is one thing, but the animals spend most of their time hunting for food in the ocean. So the team's next challenge is to protect the ecosystem out there too. So the log is this, um, it's kind of like a Fitbit, you know, Fitbit that people use that um, for exercise. Mm -hmm. So we put the same on penguins, but this one has a GPS as well. So we put this on the back of the penguins. They go out at sea, and everything gets recorded inside here. Um, and those birds, they can go really, really far from, from here. Yeah, yes. I got one back the other day who went straight out to tw towards Tasmania. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and they can stay out in the ocean for like eight days before they oh, come they back can, to land. Oh, they can, mm. you know, they're very, very comfortable on the water. Small cameras have also been attached to the penguins to gain insights into their behaviour in the ocean. Little penguins hunt during the day, diving down to approach their prey from below so they can see them against the sunlight. The blue feathers on their backs give them camouflage when they're rising from the depths, and the white feathers underneath help stop them being seen by their own predators such as sharks. And so what data, what information are you trying to collect from this? 
So we want to see, importantly, where the penguins are going, um, so where those feeding hotspots are. And with the accelerometer and the time depth, we can see where they're actually encountering prey. So we can see where they're just swimming straight out and when they're then diving. Um, and then Andre can use the um, information about where they're going for um, marine spatial planning to protect those places where the penguins are foraging. Penguin parents take it in turns to go out hunting while the other stays at home with the chicks. Megan has identified a penguin to track that's been sitting on an egg for a week now, so is due to head back out to sea very soon. Okay, that's a nice spot to, yeah. to set up the logger. Set up here. Okay. And see if we, um... okay, so Sylvia, we'll give you the book. Okay. So you have the important job of writing down um, some of our data. So we need to take the weight of the penguin, mm -hmm. and you can write that down there. So that's all the information. Um, her pit number and her nest, and we also need to write down how long we take to put the tracker on her. Uh, so this is this is how you're going to stick the yeah. logger to the penguin. Okay. So we're going to get the little pieces of tape ready and a couple of zip ties. And we put two zip ties on birds in incubation because they're going to be out there for a bit longer. So we want to make sure it's extra secure. Okay. So we're going to grab the bird and. Uh, as soon as I grab a bird, I want you to time, because we want to record how long it takes to do this. Uh -huh. Why okay? do we do that? Oh, it's, it's our ethics uh, requirement. So we have to tell how long it takes to, to how long we hold the bird for. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's to try and minimize the amount of time Correct, that you yeah. handle the penguins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So put the pressure yeah. on us to yeah. do this as fast as we can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you let me know when to start the clock. Yeah. Let's go there okay. today. Okay, as soon as I grab the bird, yep. you start, okay? Okay, yep. Oh, wow. Hello. <coughs> so, see you now this important job. You just hold that for me, okay? Are you free? Let's go there. Grab this bird. Okay, let's let's take the weight now. Okay. So we get yes. No, oh, you. Very good. <laughs> you. So this is M forty one zero four zero. So we. This logger will track where the penguins dive to look for prey and where they accelerate to catch it. The team also analyzes the penguins' scat to see exactly what they've eaten and weigh them before and after their hunting trips to see how much fish they were able to catch. So far, the research has shown that over two breeding seasons, the penguins need to eat an estimated 219 tonnes of sardines and 215 tons of red cod, all within 30 kilometers of the island. Do you to take the lid off? No, 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 we, we put them the same way. Oh, That's the, oh stop. <laughs> the logger was attached in four minutes, 40 seconds, just within the five minute limit. Amazing. We had to be really quiet the whole time while we were doing it because we don't want to distress the penguins. Um, but it was amazing to see how she just kind of folded the little feathers in and then attached the bit bit basically. Now the penguin's gone back in the burrow and hopefully tonight it'll go out to sea and give them some good data. What is this data for? Like, what's the big picture plan for this research? Uh, so by doing this, by mapping this, we know what was the, the hot spots of feeding for the penguins. The other part of the question is that who else is actually in those areas? So is there is, is the fishery there? Is the fishermen there? Is there a commercial fishery? Is there a recreational fishery? Is there shipping, commercial shipping? Is there gas and oil? So all those players that's now using the ocean, they actually on the area that penguins are going to. So. We're trying to get the information as accurate or as fine scale as possible so then we can work with them a plan 
to for them to use the, the ocean and for the penguins to use the ocean without overlap the activity. So which time of the year is crucial for the penguins? And and this time, these crucial times may not be crucial for them to be there. Then it's okay, I'll, I can be out of the air in that you know that you know month. So we negotiate. Through these negotiations, Andre hopes to protect the penguins' feeding grounds into the future, something that's becoming increasingly important as climate change disrupts marine life. The, the state of Victoria, where we are, they've been very uh, forward on, on protect the marine ecosystem. I, I believe that the information we collect in the penguins, the importance of the penguins for, for the local economy, and that's how it would help the protection of the penguins and in the process, the protection of the marine system where the penguins live in. The fact that penguin-related tourism is worth more to the state of Victoria here than commercial fishing is a real boost to Andre's team's bargaining power. To have iconic species as, a, as your flagship to, to a particular conservation helps a lot. Hundreds of thousands of tourists come here each year to watch the penguins waddle ashore at dusk. So we can see them out on the ocean now. They kind of clump together in a big group and then they sort of surf in on the waves and they're just coming close to the shore. Oh, can you hear them? Oh, they've just come over the horizon. Amazing, look at that. Oh, wow. It's so cute to see them all waddling in together and the fact that they're coming ashore in such numbers is a real testament to the conservation work that they're doing here and hopefully the revenue from these tourism activities will help ensure that they're protected well into the future. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.